Welcome back to Killer Fun, where we explore the intersection of crime and entertainment every other week. I'm Christy. And I'm Jackie. And we're so glad that you're back with us today. Today, today we are talking about Lula Rich, super soft leggings, check, bold patterns, check, a fantastic business opportunity, wow. Mm. Oh, and again, we have a puppy and a dog. Oh, a puppy who just stole a towel. <laughs> It's it's a zoo in here, but it's uh, so fun. A little bit, but it's it, you know. So if you hear puppy noises, or the, you know, I'll try and keep him from chewing on the table yeah. this time, which I didn't <laughs> notice until he was editing last time. <laughs> that there yeah. was a puppy chewing on the table. We'll have to pay attention to that one. Yeah, but whatever. Just it's fine to pull <laughs> pull the towel around. It's a mess. It's but so whatever. crazy. There. Full puppy mode right now. Yeah. Like, we were baby dog kind of the last time we recorded. Uh-huh. Right? She was still kind of chewy, uh-huh. but very, very, like, oh, cuddly and mm-hmm. all of that. And now she's in full-on puppy mode. Like, she does the puppy run. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? With yes. all the legs kind of splaying mm-hmm. out. and It's like full-on toddler mode. Oh, yeah. Inquisitive, curious about everything. hmm Yeah. Yep. She even had her morning nap. Yeah. Oh, So now she's very excited. She just licked the wall. Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Lick the wall. Anyway, okay. so I hate to say I enjoyed watching it, but I did enjoy watching it. Well, yeah, I think it was a good docuseries. I think it it, it was very entertaining mm-hmm. and I think mostly factual. It did seem to be factual. Uh-huh. I mean, they definitely told it through the eyes of the people and didn't really inject a lot of extra you know, investigative uncovering outside right. of their stories, except right. to fill in gaps here and there where mm-hmm. you might need a little background, right. I thought. Yes, because if you weren't involved with LuLaRoe, you might not understand what was happening at their training events and things. Right. So there was some extra information, but I didn't feel like it was a docuseries where the where the maker is literally trying to uncover a story. R- right. This is more giving people a platform to share their story Mm -hmm. and giving you some background. How accurate that is. As far as I can tell, it's mostly pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who are we to tell these people that their experience was not their experience? True. Absolutely. Uh, Not me. I don't. This was their experience. So Mm -hmm. so the cast really are people just talking about their experiences. Positive and less than positive. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the directors, Jenner First and Julia Willoughby Nason, they've collaborated on several documentary style projects and pretty much every project that either the, of them have worked on since 2015, they've worked on together. The most recent and big one was uh, Fire Fraud about the fire oh, festival. yeah. <laughs> so they might have a niche. They might have a niche. They might have a niche. Disasters. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I'm just gonna break the tension here. <laughs> Lula Row is a disaster. It's a disaster. And and MLMs, okay, I'm just gonna come right out. Yes, please. We do. have a bias. Because we we do. You and, and I, I'm gonna admit it. Yeah, we do not like MLMs. We don't support them. No. We feel like they are just a, a way to legally run a pyramid scheme yes. until you get caught and, and then just you find out how to shut them down. Right. That's how it feels to us. We don't like them. So we come at it from that bias, mm-hmm. um, which makes it even more interesting to watch this documentary because it's a lot of confirmation what we think. Well, and I only because there's a lot of... Research suggesting how detrimental MLMs are for the vast majority of participants. There are a lot of promises made and not a lot of promises kept. I'm loath to say there are no good multi level marketing companies out there, but I kind of think there maybe aren't. That's what I mean by bias because I think you and I both have done a lot of reading into, you know, what has been researched and we've read personal stories. We've experienced MLMs as people who have been the marketing prospect, right? For yes. people in an MLM trying to either sell product or sell the business. Right. So we have a negative view of it, but it has been sort of rounded out by what we have read. And 
what has been researched and the data that's been collected. But you're right. I think our bias is strong enough that it is hard for us to imagine an MLM ever being uh, proper or working or being a good experience or even done with good intentions. So that's right. I would th- that's where where we are like we're not objective. Right. <laughs> you all suck. And I mean <laughs> and I really tried to come at this really objectively. I really tried to come at this with I'm going to watch this. I'm going to try and understand if this one is different because everybody thinks that their MLM that they work for is different. Mhm. Yeah, I I don't know if that I had such great intentions. I mean, I really tried to understand where people were coming from, why they're, why they feel so invested, if it's possible for them to do well yeah. within the company. A- aside from the, there's always going to be somebody who doesn't really work very hard, you know, and so they're not going to do well at their business. But is it a matter of not working hard enough or is it a matter of being set up to fail? Well, absolutely. I mean, not working hard enough just doesn't seem to account for enough of the failure that you see. And the anomalies of the successful ones, their opportunity and their hard work don't seem to also account for right. their success enough. And right. so there just seems to be something wrong with it. And you're right. I, I will say that I was interested to hear... I did have a question. I guess I should say that. I don't think I tried to come in objectively. I think I wasn't a good enough person for that. Um, (laughs) But I did come in wondering, Uh do the founders have good intentions? And, Uh and, or do they not? Like, I wanted to hear their side of the story and kind of see them tell it and say, okay, I think they're just lying. Or I can see how they got bamboozled by their own kind of domino effect, right? Right. Like they had this success and it kind of grew and then they got kind of, oh, well, maybe this would work. And I don't know, maybe some sort of, (laughs) I don't know. I just wanted to mitigate the responsibility and see how people fall into it Mm -hmm. so that maybe we could, as a society, correct it. You know, I was kind of looking at the broader and then when I listened to them talk, I had lots of opinions. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it really seemed to me like Deanne maybe started it from a really good place. Mm -hmm. And then Mark came in with his Amway experience and uh, shaped things. Yep. And But that sounds like she didn't have any ownership of it. Right. But she totally did. She totally did. She she should start. Okay. So she started a business that was actually legit. Yeah. Like normal. Yeah. Like I make skirts. And then I yeah, sell them I, to retailers. Or I buy dresses at a discount and sell them. To other retailers, to, which yeah, would or, be a distributor. Or, well, she didn't even do that. She bought dresses at a discount and then had parties to sell them for a profit. Right, pop-ups. Great. A Super. pop-up store is totally yeah. fine. Uh, yes. I mean, all of the ways that she was selling and doing things are very uh, legal <laughs> and, and very typical ways to build a business. Uh-huh. She seems to have a talent. Yeah. I thought it was ingenious how they would go to the fabric store and get fabric and knowing that it was going to be the clearance fabric, so it was going to sell out, and they created a natural sense of urgency Mm -hmm. by also taking what would have been discarded and using that. I thought, oh, I can see so much potential in what she was doing. Right. And... And then. because they chose to go to the MLM structure instead of like a distributor structure mm-hmm. where you have territories where, you know, you have yeah. to apply and have some sort of skill and expertise mm-hmm. in order to be able to be an independent distributor. They just take anybody with five grand. Right. I mean, or a franchise sort of thing. They could have, she could have done so much. Yeah. And it just. Why <sighs> choose the MLM except insatiable greed? greed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, greed. Exactly. That's really greed. the only reason to choose the MLM model. Yeah. Is not to give an opportunity to people. It's to take advantage of people. Yes. Because all of those things that they were talking about, about the uh underutilized workforce of stay-at-home moms who have the capacity to do work, but they need flexibility. Some of the things that Mark was saying, which are absolutely polished statements, and he knows what he's saying, are founded on the truth, which is why they sound kind of like truth to a lot of people. He's not wrong. 
Right. Our country doesn't do a great job of providing work opportunity for families. Or just support and acknowledgement of the work that mm-hmm. a stay-at-home parent does. Right. That it's not free labor, no. which is what it is. It supports our economy in a lot of really oh, yeah. huge and important ways. And it's a completely unrecognized. Completely. And if we could recognize that, then we could also figure out how to extend opportunity to work within the home outside the home, as stay-at-home moms. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's something I juggled a lot. I was always a, quote, stay-at-home mom who also happened to work outside the home, technically. I mean, like, Uh I'm doing air quotes. Right. As if, listeners, you can't actually see me do that. But, you know, air quotes. Uh Um, I worked outside the home um, because I, I did ministry, Right. Continued to do ministry. And then I uh, owned a business. I started a business. Mm -hmm. Um, But that entire time, I still worked at home and with my kids. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the way that Mark talks about that and that Dan talks about that that resonates. Yes. I got it. And I still didn't like it. Because it felt very patriarchal. It was. And yes, because it it is. It was. their, Their approach was. Yes. Had it not been, they might have created a better business model well, that would have been reputable and supported the economy. They could have changed the world. Right. These two were smart enough to actually just do that. Yeah. Bummer. Yeah, it is a bummer. <laughs> All right. Let's recap. Now, we watched the whole thing. Oh, yeah, the whole thing. So I... It, my recap isn't going to nearly cover it all. Yeah, this is one it's you're like, going to have to go watch it's to just, really join in the conversation, well, I think. <laughs> and I mean, I'll, I'll make sure that I talk about the context within things, which you need to know, either because you haven't wa- yet watched the series, mm-hmm. maybe you don't have Amazon Prime and aren't don't have it available to watch, or perhaps you just haven't had time yet. Mm-hmm. Also fine. I'll give as much context as needed to really kind of understand things. Rocking. Yeah. Good, good, so, good. So recap. Mark and Deanne Stidham share their origin story of LuLaRoe. Swap meet children's dresses led to maxi skirts, which led to leggings, which led to distributors, which led to the MLM structure that Mark was familiar with as part of Neutralite and Amway. The company grows extremely rapidly, and the couple hires a whole bunch of family to help run it, despite the fact that many of them lack the appropriate skills and or training to do the jobs that they're hired. Uh, Before long, there are training events. And a surprise draw is Mario Lopez. He was available. He was way under budget. (laughs) I felt so bad. I felt a little bad, but I'm also like, the reason Mario Lopez is on television now is because of LuLaRoe. You know, I like Mario Lopez. He's fine. And so, you know what? Good for him. You know? It's fine. Something good had to come out of this. (laughs) I guess. So we hear from some people was still in the company, obviously, Mark and Deanne. We hear from Jill, who's a current rep who's been with them for a long time. And as a side note, she's also a pink Cadillac Mary Kay lady. That's all I'm going to say about that. Makes sense. Then there are depositions of other people who are still within the company. Now, they're not on the IMTB because they didn't sit down for an interview. Their depositions are part of public record, so that's how they were able to get them. Um, We also hear from people who uh, separated and didn't have a good experience. There were former employees, Liana, who uh, exposes some shady design practices, Daryl, who was the customer service rep, Sam, who was an event coordinator, and Deanne's nephew, Mm -hmm. one of those nepotism situations we hear from former retailers roberta lachey courtney ashley the ivanovskis all these people who were pretty high up in the organization and have found themselves either separated because of lula row or because of their own understanding of what was happening that it took them a while to realize it or the compensation changed and it no longer made sense for them and then we hear from some experts robert fitzpatrick who's an mlm expert and opponent uh, kelly percaro an attorney representing former retailers becca who just instead of becoming an mlm rep she started following lawsuits against LuLaRoe. Like, that was just, like, a thing that interested her. 
And so she kind of became this expert on the lawsuits that were going on with LuLaRoe, which I thought was actually really kind of fun. She was fun. She I really became this advocate for yeah. the retailers. So there was a huge rise in 2015. And it doesn't really last very long because there is a mass exodus of retailers and a whole bunch of lawsuits by 2017. So it started in like 2012, 2013. By 2017, things are starting to fall apart. And by 2021, they're making deals with the state of Washington. So it's still operational, and th- but things have changed somewhat. Their startup costs are down a whopping 90%. From $5,000 now down to $500. The commission structure favors sales over recruitment. There is a buyback policy. We'll get to that a little later. And the company settled their biggest threat to the company type of lawsuit, which was with the state of Washington, as I mentioned. And that resulted in former retailers in that state being made monetarily whole and a lot of these structural changes that came along. So there's a whole lot more stinky leggings and oh, there's all kinds so of many stuff. Interesting like, things. Like, what in the world? I just <laughs> can't imagine running a business like that. I, I mean, mean of, of that scale and of. Okay, so I I think there's two very interesting themes happening here. Okay. There's the disaster of the MLM itself. Like, the fact that it's going to implode. Mathematically, it has to implode. Right. Which is something that the uh, docu-series makers kind of told us. They gave us some insight into that. So there is a cap on how big that pyramid could get before it has to implode. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you watch kind of the structural disaster with that and how that affects the compensation for the people and how that affects their, quote, downline and uplines and what all happens there. Then there's this like other theme that they're telling a story about what happens when a business scales and scales quickly. Uh Uh-huh. And doesn't do it well. And, And does it not really well, but also kind of well in some ways, but not in the ways that matter for the longevity. And so it's super interesting. And then I think there's this one sub theme too. It's the family business situation, oh. right? Because uh-huh. there's this weird thing that happens when a family starts a business and we think mom and pop shop and we're okay with a family business. We think large corporation, we're no longer okay with a family business. So that's a very weird thing. They started off with, it's all in their garage. Of yeah. course, they're going to get their family involved. It's just a family business. Had they gone down to the main street and opened a shop, nobody would have blinked twice about hiring all their family members because it would have been just a mom and pop shop, family owned. Right. It becomes this giant global conglomerate, you know, and all of a sudden we're like no longer okay with this. Right. The family is now the very stepping stone that's going to fall off and create the, the avalanche. Right. Um, and so it's, it's kind of interesting to watch this sub-theme and like scaling that business to that size, actually they did some pretty amazing things for not knowing what they were doing. Right. Right? Like they were started as this family business and all of a sudden they're like booking Mario Lopez and uh-huh. doing these giant things and thousands and thousands of retailers and holy crap. Like mm-hmm. they built a gorgeous building. Like yeah. they nailed some of the pretty. The surface stuff. Mm-hmm. That's what they nailed. Mario Lopez, pretty. Yeah. The building, Pretty. pretty. Yeah, the uh, training events were pretty. pretty yeah. They talked a lot about, you know, emotional and feeling a community and, you know, and all of these things, may, purpose and, you know, it was probably very evangelistic for them as well, which is a whole other theme. Um, and so there's this whole thing that they did, you know, actually pretty well, but in the context of such a I toxic mean, and and rotten root. Yeah. I think the thing with the family business is that it's... When it's a little shop and it's just the family, Mm -hmm. that's fine. But when it's the family at the top running the things and there's people below them who are suddenly being harmed Mm -hmm. because they're not actually employees, but nor are they business owners. Right. I'm sorry. If you have an MLM, you're just not a business owner. No, you're not. You're really, really not. Frankly, if you're good enough to be a business owner and you're doing kind of fairly well there are places that will actually pay you to do that yeah yeah like literal places that will actually allow you to do that even direct sales or you can still travel yeah and if you enjoy that yeah you can get 
benefits, benefits, and vacation days, and bonuses, sick at legit. days, yeah. yeah. Like you, and you don't have to ask your friends and family to support you, right? You don't. You There's, really don't. Yeah. Don't don't trade your friendship for money. No, because that's where it's at. Right. You start I mean, trading your friendship for money, and, and we then, recognize you're not a business owner. Yeah. Because that's not professional. No, it's really not. Okay, so Vulture found this to be a perfectly adequate doc, <laughs> I th- which I thought was funny. Lou, okay. Lou the Rich will be right up your alley if your alley is docu-series about cults, docu-series about sc- scams, true crimes, podcasts about any of those things, or sighing with resignation while scrolling past a Facebook post for any of the MLMs. Mm-hmm. Which I thought that was kind of funny. Kind of on the nose. Yeah. They did talk about, you know, the, it kind of had a little bit of a gossipy sensibility. It did. Yeah. Because it was these people like sharing their stories. And they like didn't realize that they were being a little had. uh, uh, Well, Mark and Deanne definitely didn't realize they were being had. No. Until like the last episode. Yeah. Like that's it. That's (laughs) why I realized. It was the end of the episode the end of their interview before they realized that this was not a puff piece about entrepreneurs this was a hard look at their business model and why it's problematic (laughs) Uh, but i i that little bit of deception to make them feel like that mm -hmm. and allow them to talk was very interesting it it really was it really was. But they basically, they were like, yeah, it's a little gossipy, but overall, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reality Blurred found the account of Mark and Deanne pitted against the retailers to be illuminating, which I thought this was good. There's something very effective about watching the founders of the company repeatedly extolling the virtues of their business model and then seeing example after example of what happened to their retailers, the people who bought in. It included not only the company's founders, but also everyone from bitter former employees to cheerful current retailers. So there was like a whole whole gamut gamut of people. Andy Danart goes on to say... Uh, Lula Rich isn't going to take down Lula Rowe, but still compared to some of the flimsy documentary series that have been churned in recent years, Lula Rich feels substantial, like a definitive document of the rise and fall of this particular company. Yeah. Which I was like, okay, that's super fair. But you know, not everybody likes it. Oh, well, of course, somebody got hate. Well, <laughs> would you take a guess at who hates? Oh, gosh. I mean... No, because I don't want to... No, I've already been hateful enough myself, so let me just... No. Well... Let me not take a risk. Current retailers are not particularly happy with this documentary. Oh, of course. (laughs) Yeah, that... Now that you say that, that feels very obvious. Of course they wouldn't. In fact, they went through and uh, encouraged one another to go and give the documentary a one-star rating on Amazon to try and bring the ratings down. They suggested it and posted a link in their groups and when this article was written, this article from Variety was written, it had uh, about 88% five-star reviews and 9% one-star reviews. So there was a big disparity. It was either five or one. <laughs> I went and actually looked it up yesterday, September 23rd, and it has 92% five-star rating right now and 5% one star rating. So the people who appreciate the message are winning out on that battle. But so if you read some of the one star reviews, they're instructive. Okay. Because they were all told, first of all, Lularo told them all not to watch it. Of course, that sounds right up their alley. Right. But somebody commented, a lot of them are anonymous. So mm-hmm. you can't tell who wrote them, of course. Just a bunch of people who can't manage money complaining about how their business failed. Laughable, really. <laughs> I'm like, that's really not what this is. No. I'm sorry you're being snowed. Like, oh, gosh. Yeah. It's just, it's a shame. It but, is a shame. All right. So we're going to take a real quick break. We'll be right back with Is It True Psychology Break and Real Life. 
So here's how it works. Christy wrecks her search history. Hey, NSA, we promise it's nothing more nefarious than a podcast. To find out what's true, some of the psychological motivations behind the character's actions and real life applications that relate to our topic. I have no idea what Christy decided to look up. Could be the same thing that captured my curiosity or something I never thought of. Is it true? So most of the things you can verify. So there are some things maybe you can't necessarily verify, Mm -hmm. but they feel true. Right. I mean, why would these people have any reason to lie? I mean, they a lot of them lost a whole lot of money. And maybe some of it was their own poor choices. Maybe don't drop $10,000 on a dinner when you can't really afford it, even if somebody has told you that it will look good on your Instagram or whatever. You know, so there were poor choices, but it's not a system that really set up to help people succeed, unfortunately. So this is mostly stuff I was curious about. Uh, The Stidhams claim to uh, not have money to pay their creditors or uh, no reason to pay their creditors. There's a whole lot of confusion about why they're not paying their bills to the people who are making the leggings for them. Bustle has an article. uh, Deanne and Mark Stidham might be worth more than they say. That doesn't surprise me at all. They're no strangers to uh, troubled financials either. Uh, They've had 15 tax liens filed against Mark, some with and some without Dan, both in Utah and California, over the years. They've cleared them up generally. But in 2017, there's a lawsuit against the Stid... There was a lawsuit against the Stidhams that said they created 17 shell companies in order to hide assets. Wow. They say that that wasn't what they were, that they were wholly separate entities, but... They didn't have like offices or products or they were just to hide stuff. Mm -hmm. And the My Dyer lawsuit has a quote from Mark. When contacted about paying My Dyer's outstanding invoices, Mark is said to have replied, look, guys, I'm not paying you guys an effing dime unless the judge orders me to pay it. And Deanna and I will take our two or three hundred million dollars to the Bahamas and F everything. So that may be a clue to the net worth of the Stidhams in addition to their properties and assets. But the Stidhams deny re- ever saying it. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Ill gotten gains is what I call mm-hmm. that two or three hundred million dollars. Gosh, can you imagine? Oh, Jeez. Yep. As we mentioned that uh, Mark isn't a stranger to MLMs. He yes. started with Neutralite and uh, Amway. Though Those companies merged in the 70s. The MLM structure was invented in 1945 by Carl F. Renborg, who started the Neutralite that morphed into Amway. The founders of Amway, J. Van Andel and Richard DeVos began as independent distributors selling Neutralite and they kind of overtook Neutralite and enveloped it into their MLM. Which was at that point an actual pyramid scheme. Right. Technically, because that's how it got shut down. Right. And then it came back as Quickstar. Oh. Amway shut down because of all of that. Well, the it, pyramid Amway's scheme. still going. Oh, I know. And yeah. they were, got shut down because of pyramid scheme. They reinvented as an MLM with enough structural changes to uh-huh. skirt the law as Quickstar. And then eventually they you, took back, back Amway. The, oh, jeez. Quickstar was the first MLM that I was ever pitched. Really? Back in college. Oh, I'm glad you said no. You did say no, of right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'll take that back. Uh, no, it was the first one. Okay. It was the first one. I knew I, my, I had family members who were Mary Kay sellers. Yeah. But, but yeah. And yeah. back then it was a little different with Mary Kay and Avon and even it, Tupperware. Those were kind of different. I mean, they were still MLMs, but they weren't run like this. Well, but you could make money just, just selling, selling the, the products. products. If you just wanted to be... And people would get defensive. If you were the Avon lady for your neighborhood, you were the oh, Avon lady for your neighborhood. It was regional wars. Yes. Yeah, it was And they were different. like, buy from me, don't buy from them. Yeah. And here's why. In fact, I remember that certain reps would say, where do you... Oh, well, actually, I'm going to give you... This is yeah. the rep in your area. Like, it was a very different kind of feeling. Which is the way it ought to be. Right. It ought to be... So, full, full confession... 
when I was in Boston. Okay. You know, still sort of newly married and stuff. I I signed up for Avon. Oh, did you? No, mm-hmm. I always loved looking at Avon catalogs. I know because their products are great. Yeah, who doesn't love Skin So Soft? It's the freaking best bug spray on the planet. Uh-huh. You know, like, and it was great. And so I thought, okay, I can do that. And I went through the training, and actually, they they flat out kind of said like, recruiting is a different thing if you want to be a mentor to other people. Okay. Like it was like if you're interested in doing that. Uh-huh. That's like, okay, now you're going to become a human resources person. Like my person that recruited me was like, so I mentor, I have, I have to hold training sessions. Okay. Like she was like, it's kind of a different part of the job. So if you're interested in that, we can talk about that. Other than that, really, this is just, just about go sell. go sell. And she, it was a very different thing. And that was even in 2004. Yeah. Very different. Not in do nothing, but yeah. Oh, well, what are you going to do? That's fine. Then I was picked, uh, or no, I was pitched a thousand since then. Oh. And they were all very. I've literally never been to an MLM party, and I've been to a lot. I don't go anymore, but Mm -hmm. I've literally never been to one where they didn't also mention, this is a great opportunity, you should join me. Yeah, oh, yeah, every one of them. In fact, some I've gotten into, I didn't know it was that. Oh. Right? That, that's how the quick star stuff started. Yeah. They you, would invite people to say, oh, you know what? I'm having some uh, some training on how to become your own boss, and it's just a little seminar. You can come to coffee. It's like a support group, and it turned out to be a pitch for quick star. Oh. Right? And the same thing has happened to me with multiple other places where I've been invited to like uh, oh, come ladies' to night. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it turned out to be... They used to do that at Bunko a lot. Oh, yeah. Like they'd have sponsored prizes for oh, Bunko uh-huh. and it would be an oh, MLM. Oh man. Was stunk. I'm like, I'd really much rather just bring five dollars and play Bunko and somebody gets cash at the end of the night. Right. I, I don't I don't want your crummy prize. No. I don't want your stinky leggings. No. <laughs> no hamburger leggings for me. <laughs> uh, uh, so former employee Daryl mentioned there was this color personality test that was part of the hiring process <laughs> she totally thought of you <laughs> but um it might have been uh thomas insights based on what he was saying and um they have four colors i'd like you to pick one. Oh, okay, okay uh blue green yellow or red green uh-huh green so caring encouraging sharing patient and relaxed oh thanks yeah that I tells would, you everything you need to ever know about me. <laughs> All right, what's your color? Uh, it would also have been green. Yeah, you yeah, it's green. Yeah, blue is cautious, precise, deliberate, questioning, and formal. See, and I think you would maybe fit in. You would be more of a teal. Yeah, probably so. Mm-hmm. Yellow is sociable, dynamic, demonstrative, enthusiastic, and persuasive. And red is competitive, demanding, determined, strong-willed, and purposeful. Mm. Now, of course, they have this as they talk about it as a guide, how to get your team to work better together, not as a hiring practice. Yeah. Which we've talked about that before. Hiring practices are... Yeah. Personality tests and, per- and hiring practices are, are unethical. Yes. Going there, it's unethical. It is unethical because it does tend to make it difficult for neurodivergent people to do well on them. There are a very... I say few, and by that, I probably the number might be like hundreds of thousands and millions, but there's a few types of industries where a personality test during hire, hiring might be uh, necessary. And in that case, most of the businesses or companies or government entities that might employ those are using professionals to administer and interpret. Right. And so some of those are when you're going into high stress jobs where you're going to encounter emotional trauma on Uh a regular basis. Some of those might be where team synergy is so important that it really is do you fit our team and we Mm -hmm. can't risk that not really working. Right. And in that case, it's just a highly competitive sort of like, oh, we got to choose the right person. Right. Um, 
those kinds of there are few and far between yeah. examples of where that is an appropriate use. Yeah. And uh, LuLaRoe was not, not it. Not it. Especially because <laughs> you're supposed to be some independent business owner. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, and he, to be fair, he did work at the corporate office. Mm-hmm. It wasn't an independent business owner sort of situation for him. That's true. That's true. But I would say still inappropriate. Still. I don't think meritocracy really... Means what Mark thinks it means. Because <laughs> he said Lula Rose and meritocracy. And I'm like, let's look up the definition of meritocracy with Merriam Webster a system, organization, or society in which people are chosen and moved into positions of success, power, and influence on the basis of their demonstrated abilities and merit. I think getting in early to the MLM to the top of the period pyramid doesn't necessarily mean you have demonstrated abilities. No, not to mention the inherent racism and cultural disparities in our definitions of quote merit. Right. Exactly. Because uh, in our culture, you know, we have to admit that we have some cultural standards of merit that aren't necessarily inclusive of what is our country. We have a melting pot, so we have a right. lot of different cultures. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's necessarily prejudiced or even hateful to identify that, oh, this culture, this is how they sort of define merit. And so this is how sort of they work. And right. I, so I'm not, I'm not hurt or offended by people describing certain things as worthy of, of merit, right. credibility and things right. like that, that are very American sort of personalities or certain things that we just do in our culture. I, I'm I'm okay with the fact that we have our own culture and mm-hmm. that's fine. But we mm-hmm. are very, very I mm, oh, I'm trying to be white very careful. centered. Yeah. It's very well, I mean if you look at what is professional hairstyles, what is professional dress, what is, you know, professional things, they tend to be very much white. white. And so we don't do a good job of representing the whole of our culture. Right. Exactly. Or understanding where that changes. Right. Like maybe it's okay for you to to find those things credible. Oh, they're very professional. I like the way they speak or communicate. Mm-hmm. I also recognize that's kind of how they are and that's delightful. But in our culture here in America, we also then have to look at another individual and say, oh, I find the merit in that culture. Right. Right. Um, learning how to just work together through yeah. that. Right. Ooh. Exactly. But I don't think meritocracy no. is what he said it was. It, because not at all. And LuLaRoe is certainly not one. Certainly I'm, not. I'm sorry. That was his excuse. Right. right. That's how he got out of right. taking responsibility for people who couldn't make their, quote, businesses work. Yeah. So LuLaRoe told their retailers not to participate in the drama triangle. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, what is the drama triangle? Let's look this up. That was up. very interesting. Uh, so Stephen Karpman came up in the 1960s with this dysfunctional social interaction power game, which is the drama triangle. Thank you, Leadership Tribe, for this article mm-hmm. explaining it. And there's three three parts to it. All of them are dysfunctional. The rescuer, the persecutor, and the victim. So the victim is poor me. And this is what they said every retailer who was not successful was. Mm -hmm. Poor me. I'm a victim. They're unwilling to take responsibility for their undesirable circumstances and don't think that they have power to change their lives. Well, they certainly don't have a whole lot of power to change their lives when it comes to being on the bottom of pyramid. No. The rescuer wants to help them. But they're offering short-term fixes to victims rather than long-term fixes. So I would say LuLaRoe maybe tried to see themselves as a a rescuer who offered long-term, but they were not. Instead, I really think that LuLaRoe really does fall into the third category of persecutor. It's all your fault. Yes. Because persecutors blame victims and criticize the behavior of rescuers without providing appropriate guidance, assistance, or solution to the problem, which is exactly what they were doing because they basically said, if you're not successful, it's because you didn't try hard enough. And every MLM tells their people that. Yep. It was, you didn't try hard enough. We gave you all the tools. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't give them a sheet of leads. 
Mm -mm. You didn't provide them a compensation structure that makes it possible for them to do fine just selling the product. You didn't eliminate competition. Mm -hmm. Yep. What did you do? You did nothing except blame them. Right. Blame the literal victims. Yep. LuLaRoe is in business for now. Tough Nickel had an article in January of 2021 uh, talking about uh, reasons why they might be going out of business. Now, this was just before they did the settlement. Okay. But they had some reasons that the customers aren't satisfied. And they go on to clarify that the customers are not the end users. They are not the people who buy the leggings from the retailers. The retailers are the customers. Oh, okay, yeah. And they're okay. they're not real satisfied with the products. Their return policy. So in January when they wrote this article, it was a 90% refund if you decided you were going to go out of business or okay. you had things you couldn't sell. It looks like it's 85% now instead of 90, which is still not great, but okay, maybe you're not going to lose your shirt, except it's got really strict standards. Oh yeah, they kind of mentioned this. Uh-huh. Those standards include, but are not limited to, merchandise that was purchased by the consultant within the past year with tags still attached and packaging that hasn't been damaged. So that's a problem because these consultants open up the packaging. To have the pop-ups. To have the pop-ups, to have their Facebook Live events, to show the merchandise. It's one thing to still have the tags on it, but if you can't have even opened the plastic, you can't. Return it. Basically, you can't return it. So if you get a customer that ends up with a, Lulu fail where they have something untoward in the mm-hmm. crotch area. Yes. They can is... return it to you, but you have to eat it. Oh. The, you can't return it to the company because you've opened the package and it's not resaleable as new. Consultants don't get to pick their merchandise. Now this yeah. used to be true. This is it's a little bit different now. Okay. So it used to be. You would place your order and they sent you whatever. The patterns we're talking about. No, whatever. You would say, I need leggings. You didn't get to pick sizes. You didn't get to pick patterns. Not even the sizes. Not even sizes. Now you can pick, I need five pairs of leggings in these sizes. I need, you know, the cardigan or whatever Mm -hmm. in this size. Okay. You can select sizes now, but you still cannot select patterns. Okay. I mean, I hate that for them, but also I do know that that's part of the allure that is part of the allure, but it's outdated. That's one of their yeah. other ones. Is there, you know, that those big bold patterns were a thing mm-hmm. in the early 20 teens. Yeah. That was real big. And when that went out of fashion and more modest, subdued styles became mm-hmm. more popular, but LuLaRoe didn't change. Didn't really change. So I went and looked at their disclosure statement for 2020. Oh, okay. It's illuminating. Ooh, ooh, do read. Um, so for the year 2020, the average retailer's gross profit was just over $10,000. But the median gross profit was about $1,400. So okay. average and median were different. So mm-hmm. if you let's go back to talk real quickly about your uh, middle school math. Yeah. <laughs> Average is you take all of all of the numbers and you add them together and then divide by the number of numbers you had. Right. So you are take an average of something, you know, two, right. four, six, eight, ten. You add them all together mm-hmm. and divide by five. Yeah. Yeah. And you get a number. Now, the median is actually a better representation mm-hmm. here because you take all the numbers and you put them in order from least to greatest or greatest to least. Either way, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. And you pick the center, center. number. And that tells you what's in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a little more helpful in this particular scenario. Now, they have a little graph on their disclosure statement. About 50% of their distributors uh, made somewhere between $1,000 and $5,000. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, they made some money. Okay. The next biggest chunk of people is the people who lost Anywhere from $1 to $5,000. And that was about 16%. Okay. A lot of people lost money. And that's just gross. Uh, Yeah. 
We're not yes. even talking about whether these people actually made an income profit because we're not well, even looking at their individual nets. Right. Yes. What did they spend on shipping materials? Mm-hmm. What did they spend on hangers? What did they mm-hmm. spend on venues? What did they spend on entrance fees to get into the craft fair? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, if only if only fifty percent are making one to a thousand gross, mm-hmm. and then you account for. Uh, you know, other business expenses. Right. Uh, that sends a lot more of them, I bet, into the negative. Yeah. And I sends would... the negative way down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm betting so. And uh, over 85% didn't receive any earnings through the the leadership compensation plan, which is the recruiting mm-hmm. portion. So most people were not able to recruit. Now, this was... Also illuminating, I went and looked at their application page. Ooh, okay. And, you know, what do they want? How much information do they want from you? How much does it cost now? You know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's down to $500 and Mm -hmm. you get 35 pieces or something. And you can choose the items and sizes, but you can't choose patterns, of course. It's a whole thing. But at the bottom, in small print, I'm going to read it to you. Okay. LuLaRoe does not guarantee or represent directly or indirectly that you will derive any income as a retailer. To the extent any income discussed by LuLaRoe or by retailers recognized by LuLaRoe, such discussion represents exceptional results and does not represent and should not be interpreted as typical income of retailers. You should not expect to achieve similar results. This is the small print. This is a, literally oh. like the thing that people don't read. Yeah. Before they click yes, take my money. It makes me it breaks my heart. They do admit that there are factors within your control, which mm-hmm. is what they tried to say it was it was all if you fail it's yeah. all oh. factors within your control. They also do uh recognize that there's some factors outside of your control which might Include demand, market condition, but also changes to the LuLaRoe program. Mm -hmm. That's without your control. Yep. Yep. But they still call it your own business. As with any independently owned business, individual results will vary. So they're still still banking on this meritocracy, trying to make you feel like you're not typical. Yes. So by saying it's not typical results, they're actually sort of giving you a little nudge to say, but because you are not typical, yeah, you are going to be exceptional, uh-huh. right? Like in a way, it doesn't disclaim anything. It, uh, you know, is that a verb? Can you use it that way? Disclaim, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know. It is now. Uh, it's not really that they're that they're giving you like a disclaimer that like, whoa, be careful. It's, they're actually using it in a kind of a manipulative way mm-hmm. by oh. framing it with the rest of that. You're not typical, right. which is probably what people feel like. I won't be typical. We're, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> oh, good. So um, Helen Ann Peterson has a sub stack okay. that she uh, writes, and she interviewed Meg Connolly, who's another writer, who has some experience with both MLMs. Mormonism and Dean Stidham. Oh, okay. So okay. she, uh, they, they put this together, uh, together. And Meg Connolly tells us that Deanne was in her LDS congregation in Chino Hills. Okay. When Meg was a child, she went to some of the, the like swap meet parties. Okay. And Deanne said she went to a swap meets to get these dresses, right? Yeah. And it was probably the Orange County swap meet. Meg says that they weren't the exact same brands being sold in Nordstrom and Saks, but they were similar, mm-hmm. but they were not the exact same brands, which okay. is what Deanne said they were. Right. And that she remembers going to one of these parties when she was okay. little. And her mom said she was never willing to buy from Deanne. She just didn't think she was honest. She didn't think she was safe. So interesting. Is, yeah, it was very interesting. And uh, Meg's takeaway from her childhood was this. My childhood takeaway was that MLMs were scams, but they were scams. You had to be polite to the scammer because they didn't know they were being scammed. Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. Because it's very rampant. We'll, we'll get to oh, that Oh, we'll have minute. to get to that too. Yeah. 
It's super, super interesting. There's a lot of pseudo feminism that they talk about yes. in this. And then she talks about this uh, image that Deanne posed in the, I believe it was the first episode where she talked about her mother coming home from a catering job with a whole bunch oh, of $5 yes. bills. Oh, and gosh. she threw $3,000 to the kids. She talked about that like it was this empowering wonderful yeah. situation and i thought it was really gross i'm like you're pitting the kids against one another yeah and i did not like, like that at all i didn't the like the whole it idea of her like looking up and going money uh-huh. money like just they were so excited about money and now i'm not not excited about money right but there did seem there's a gleam in the eye when she was telling that story and other times when they're talking about making money uh-huh that's just so like Ooh, it does. It puts you off a little bit. Right. It, I found it really off-putting. And Meg had this insight. Her mom's work outside the home is justified by the way it blesses her family. It's super important to Deanne's ideology that when her mom made money, it was literally showered on the family. In the prosperity gospel, people believe that if you are very good, financial blessings will rain down from heaven. That's very true. Yep. In this worldview, being able to buy things ju- isn't just proof that you have money. It's proof that you've been good enough and worked hard enough. And which is actually probably a large part of the meritocracy that uh, Mark likes to talk about as well. Mm-hmm. So here's the thing that got left out. Ooh. That is, they talk about primarily suburban, white, religious women who are getting sucked into these things. Yeah. But they're completely ignored the work that's being taken for granted, which is who is creating these products. The products, yeah. They completely ignored that. Yeah. I mean, I get that that wasn't part of the scope of their story. But it really, like, who's really at the bottom of this pyramid scheme? The People in Indonesia making two dollars an hour, mm-hmm. or at best, to make leggings. Right. I mean, and that was just completely left out. And there's a whole discussion on whiteness and feminism in this mm-hmm. that's absolutely worth a read. I, oh, good. Yeah, but it's really good. All of the sources that we use to inform our discussion here on Killer Fun Podcast can be found on our social media. Join us on Facebook at Killer Fun Podcast, exploring the intersection of crime and entertainment. You can find us on Twitter at Killer Fun Pod, or you can send us an email at KillerFunPodcast at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to share a link to whatever information you're looking for. We love to hear from you. You might learn a little something, too. All right, psychology break. Okay. Now, I'm going to say this. I know a number of LDS families. Mm -hmm. They're delightful, Mm -hmm. wonderful kind, giving, loving people. They do not see themselves as in a cult in any way. I'm totally fine with that. It is a different religion. It is not my religion, but I appreciate that they have a deep belief that encourages kindness and responsibility. Mm -hmm. I just want to get that out there. Okay, (laughs) okay. Religion News Service has an article, 10 Reasons Mormons Dominate Multilevel Marketing Companies. Now, interesting. Harrison, who wrote this blog, is herself LDS. Oh, okay, all right. So I'm I'm trying to come at this very gently. That makes sense. I, yeah, I we're, we're talking me. about top level trends, not individuals. Yes, right now, for sure, for sure. So she has some ideas about why people within her community, okay, Mormons, mm-hmm. might be particularly susceptible okay. to MLMs, and there's some cultural and ideological things happening there that maybe make them a little more susceptible. That I would say Mark and Deanne absolutely took advantage of. Okay, let's hear them. Um, so insularity. Mormons tend to be really trusting, especially of people within their community. Okay. So they believe that other Mormons are being honest. Okay. Okay. They have a really high number of stay-at-home moms. Yeah. That that's something they really, really encourage. They encourage women to stay home. But that also means that in this particular moment in society, that's challenging. It is challenging. And so this seems like a good way for them to be able to do it. 
it's easy to mobilize. Everybody has everybody else's home address, phone number, email address. Yeah. Because that's part of being in a ward together is you can get in contact with one another. And it's really beautiful community building. Yeah. But it also kind of makes reaching out to these people a little easier Mm -hmm. in a way that is maybe a little troubling. So the personal touch, Mormons are really used to hearing testimonials Mm -hmm. and they're maybe a little more vulnerable to anecdotal evidence. I did well at this. Mm -hmm. You can too than they might otherwise be. Right, okay. Um, They're used to a very top-down structure, the way the Mormon church is set up. Mm -hmm. They have very strict rules about tithing. I mean, you have to take, like, bank accounts and different things to them to make sure that you're tithing properly. Yeah. Um, So that they're really used to that. They're Mm -hmm. really used to sending money upstream. Now the Mormon church does a lot of great things. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of wonderful community outreach in the U.S. and around the world. Mm -hmm. They, you know, do a lot of wonderful things. So that money is not ne- not necessarily like an MLM. It might actually be going to good yeah. causes. There may be a little naive. Mm. Now, this is coming from a, a Mormon. Okay, so how, that, how does she explain that? That um, Mormons tend to believe that they're chosen and special. Mm-hmm. And that this is an opportunity from God, and it's going to work out for them because they're special. That wording in the mm-hmm. disclaimer down uh-huh. at the bottom, yes, is See? okay, mm-hmm. exactly fits in right there, right. So she's got other reasons, but those were the ones I thought were most yeah. salient to this particular conversation. Um, so ML- MLMs and cults use some of the same mind control techniques. Yes, they do. Oh, um, and the, the comparison's not new. No, it's not new. No, a cult is defined as an organization that exercises undue influence over its members to make them dependent and obedient. Undue influence is defined as persuasion that takes over any free will or judgment. As a legal term, it refers to a person or group taking advantage of their position of power over others. I can see how that is a little, uh, maybe, because they told these women how to dress. Go down to Tijuana and get the gastric sleeve. Right. You know, you need to be thin. You need to be blonde. You need to be pretty. You need to exude an air of success. These are the things you need to do if you want to continue to sell LuLaRoe. Right. And the dependency. Mm -hmm. The dependency by dangling shame and failure by always making it seem like they needed to do not only better, but better within the company, like with mm-hmm. the trainings and go right. here and do that and participate in this and kind of dangling that. Well, if you get more involved, then you will actually do better. And when you do better, you can be more involved. And so it's just a circle and you're stuck inside of it. Right. Yeah. Well, cults tend to use bite is the bite model. Yes. Yeah, you seem like you've heard of this. Behavioral control, dictating what a person can do, what they wear, financial exploitation and dependence, retire your husband Mm -hmm. because then you're totally dependent on LuLaRoe. Yep. You retire your husband. You need to keep working for them specifically. Information control, they'll withhold or distort information to try and make it more acceptable don't watch Lula Rich. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They they also will even in circumstances where they are living, you know, close together, uh-huh. which is kind of what we think about a lot when we think about cults, cults which is right. why we have a hard time examining cults that are not like communal, uh-huh. you know, like well, we want them to be in a commune, but information control, the, they will not just restrict information um, by distorting it or putting spin on information, but they literally will res- restrict your ability to receive information right. from outside. Right. Or they will actively, instead of just color things, they will actively try to spread misinformation and try to discredit anyone outside not the information the people so mm-hmm. that the information does not seem real right and that's just so hard it really is uh, I, I, that's so hard to combat well and that goes into the thought control mm-hmm. too where they're using loaded language or cliches yes. to help you stop critical thinking that you're using these 
false feminist buzzwords Mm -hmm. to try and seem more legitimate. Emotional control. They're told that any problems they experience are their own fault, and it's never the leader or group. Right. I mean, for real. And, I mean, basically, they... They do all these things. They love bomb you. They tell you how great you are, how special you are. They, the MLMs will deceive you. They'll have people get up on stage and talk about how much money they've earned. And you can too, Mm -hmm. when that's not the case, they'll financially exploit people. They'll use guilt, shame, fear. If you have a nine to five job, you're a failure. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry, you're not a failure to get benefits and, you know, paid vacation and time off and job security and not being at the whim of, okay, I'm doing well. I was doing great until these five other sellers popped up and now I can't, nobody Mm -hmm. wants to buy from me because these people are annoying and now they think all LuLaRoe reps are annoying. Yeah. It's, I mean, LuLaRoe is a zero sums game. You were either really, with them or against them. Yeah, unfortunately. And once you're in, anything that is a disagreement or a disparity or even just a lack of enthusiasm is taken as offense right. and against them. Yes. And that's a game you just can't win. No. You can't you win. Can't, you can't win. Or you win for a time and then you don't. Mm-hmm. All right. Real life. So real this life. was kind of some other things that or adjacent that were mentioned within this. Okay, okay. So uh, selling your breast milk? That yeah. was the thing that they that they suggested that uh, women do in order to be able to raise the money to be able to join LuLaRoe. Wait, is that not just, I mean, to suggest it to women? It's just... Well, oh. and it's just like... It's so gross because, oh, well, you're joining. You must be a young mom. Who doesn't know any better. Right. Maybe you're also lactating. Why don't you sell your breast milk? Yeah. Oh. No, please donate your breast milk. The PICUs need it. Yes. Don't sell your breast milk. Well. Donate it. Right. Right. If you're going to be a person who has extra milk and is going to have it, donate it. But the fact that they're saying sell it makes them a cow. Yeah. Y- yes. It's just it's weird. It's a real experience. Exploitative it's, of women. It's, it's one of those things like just a little, it's just enough off that it, you're like, what? But. Well, it's a big enough market that there's a whole like website that is called Only the Breast that is like Craigslist for and I know that mother's exists. milk. I know that other mothers at home are, are a market for purchasing other breast milk when they can. Right. And I, I guess I respect it. To a degree, I just, I guess I feel like that should just not be, that's like selling your organs. You can't do that either. Right. It's against the law. Yeah, to sell your organs. Yeah. Yes. I just feel like maybe. Well, you can sell to a bank. There are milk banks Mm -hmm. and they will pasteurize the milk. Right. And um, you can sell it for as much as a dollar an ounce to the milk banks, Mm -hmm. but it costs the families trying to buy it like $4 an ounce. So it's really cost prohibitive for Mm -hmm. a lot of people considering how much babies drink. Mm -hmm. But if you're, you know, if you're trying to cut out that middleman or you don't like the idea of pasteurized because it does lose some of the benefits once Mm -hmm. it's pasteurized. Um, you might want to buy from an individual. So you get about a dollar an ounce. Mm-hmm. You pay, you know, you're not having to pay for the pasteurization or whatever. But there's a uh, willing to sell to men category because men will drink it to try and bulk up. So if there's, you've got somebody who's uh, hmm. a uh, bodybuilder, mm-hmm. uh, breast milk is evidently quite a, it's like muscle milk. But natural. I just don't know how I feel about this whole industry. I guess I'm I'm struggling with it. I mean, I I'm feel struggling like with yeah. it. I mean, I guess I, I recognize the right to sell it. It's your milk. Yeah. I recognize the right to buy it if you want it. I recognize all of that. I guess I just there's something about it, it just hawks me off. Well, and know. there's like risks. There, yeah. Food safety news has a whole article about that there's the FDA said that there's risks for consuming breast milk. You can get infectious diseases, including HIV, or there might be contaminants or illegal drugs or legal drugs that are prescription that could be in these that might be detrimental to your yeah. bodybuilding 
needs. Selling it's not illegal, but it is unregulated. There was a doctor who did a study and they tested 102 samples of breast milk from across the country and found that the breast milk bought online had detectable bacteria in 93% of oh, samples. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, maybe just don't. Maybe just don't. Maybe just don't. So unlimited growth in a pyramid scheme, not a thing. Not a thing. I mean, for real, pyramidschemealert.org, which is run by Robert Fitzpatrick. Okay. Who was the expert in the LuLaRoe documentary. He found back in 2015 that major MLMs have just about reached global saturation. Okay. That you're not really going to find a lot where there's a whole lot of room to grow that saturation for large MLMs is a recent condition that means the possibility for enrolling more people than the millions who quit the schemes each year is no longer possible because a lot of people leave and they are no longer prospects. Mm -mm. He said the absurd claim for perpetual growth has always been a lie. Markets for recruits are finite and most people must always be in the bottom ranks of MLM pyramids where profit is impossible. Growth in MLMs means not enlargement of a customer base, but rather replacement of a customer base. And the customers, again, are not the people buying the end product. They are the people doing the selling of those products. TalentedLadiesClub.com had an article, uh, The 10 Ugly Truths MLMs Don't Want You to Know. I'm not going to talk about them all, but your odds okay. at making money in an MLM are worse than playing roulette in Las Vegas. Oh, gosh. Wow. Okay. For real, man. Wow. John Taylor from the Consumer Awareness Institute found that the odds of winning on a single spin of a roulette wheel in Las Vegas were 280 times six greater than the odds of profiting from Amway. Oh, my gosh. 48 times the odds of profiting as a new skin rep. 22 times as enrolling as a Melaleuca rep. You're better off taking your money and putting it down on a random number on a roulette wheel. Of a thousand people who join an MLM, 996 will lose money once you subtract their expenses. Wow. But four people made money. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's just, wow. Hearing it put that way is just. I mean, really, it's just, it's very illuminating. LuLaRoe does have the one of the most expensive startup costs. Uh huh. They mentioned that. Uh huh. That n- not just then, but even still, even with it being down ninety percent to just five hundred dollars, just five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. because everybody just has five hundred dollars to oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. throw around. Most are somewhere between thirty and a few hundred dollars. A few of them you can make money if you are not. Also recruiting. You can make money a small amount just selling product. Yeah. And you know what I've realized is that some of those, those, um, especially with cleaning products and those kind of things, really the the sellers Uh always say, I'm just a member, I get the discount. Right. So they're just me- they're just a member because then they get to buy it at wholesale, right. and then they have the opportunity to place an order and sell it and maybe make their money back or make a little profit. Mm-hmm. But they can do that without having to worry about a downline because their big thing is it's a consumable product. Right. I get a discount if I sign up to be a member. It's like signing up to go to Costco right. with this one product. <laughs> right. Yes. And so I. I I hate those less because those people tend to be less like all about the, mm-hmm. um, but on the other hand, I'm kind of like, still, why do they have this business model if they could just, what if you just sign up to be a member? Yeah. And just, you get a discount. And you being just get a, a discount. And maybe you refer a friend and you get a hundred dollar yeah. gift card. Yay. Yeah. And that's all you do. Like, okay, refer a friend and you get like a stipend for referring a friend, but they create this entire business model where you can. So it's just weird to me. It's real underhanded. It's all about greed. Yeah. Like that, all that does is for the ones who choose to go ahead and try to recruit and get commission and sell product that way. It just fattens the, the pyramid more than they could if they were just an average business. And 
it still takes advantage of people to do it. It really does. You're but they can, they get to say, oh, but, you know, you don't have to recruit people because look, yeah. look at all these people who aren't. And so they get to say, instead of meritocracy, they get to say, well, that was their choice. We just allowed them to do it. Yeah. I would Ugh. say whatever product it is the MLM is selling, there is a product similarly or lower price that is about the same quality. Yes. And there are a lot of wild claims that MLMs make. Like, I don't know if you remember, there was the one with the cleaning cloths. Oh, yeah. They have silver in them. So they cost something akin to your firstborn. (laughs) And you can just use water to clean. No, you can't. (laughs) It's still dirty. Don't clean your toilet with those. Your toilet needs some bleach. Yeah. Sanitizer. Sanitizer. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And what's really crazy is those, those little sham wow kind of cloths or those little, they're not bad. And I have one that I bought off Amazon that's like a face cloth. Uh-huh. And it's fantastic. Yeah. And it is great because if you just use water to kind of like yeah. it'll wipe it off, it'll wipe off some dirt because it's got, you yeah. know. But yeah. I still have to use face wash on a pretty regular basis. But yeah. the cloth's great. It was like yes. $12. Like the, the, cl- the cloths may be just great. fine, but they don't necessarily have, do the magical like, claims thank that you. people insist that they do. And uh, time.com has a whole article about how multi-level marketing distributors used not only the internet, but the coronavirus to cr- to grow their businesses that a lot of people who got laid off and didn't yes. or and or couldn't go to work in a public place. Oh, I can sell online. It was a whole thing. Oh, I can imagine. It's super sad. So LuLaRoe, by settling the lawsuit with the state of Washington, okay. was able to refrain from admitting any sort of wrongdoing. They paid $4.75 million to settle the lawsuit. It does not constitute evidence or an admission by any party regarding the existence or non-existence of any issue, fact, violation, or any law alleged by Washington. Ridiculous. I cannot believe that they're letting them get away with this, but they did require them to be more transparent with retailers. That's what a lot of those changes were. Mm -hmm. Mark, of course, denies any wrongdoing and says that they believe that they would have won the case eventually, but it made financial sense for them to not fight it. And that if they didn't win in court the first time, they'd win on appeal, which I'm like, that doesn't sound like you're really doing very well. But that was a pittance, a pittance compared to uh, the settlements that some other multi-level marketing companies have interesting so the biggest one was from herbalife oh that was all over the news 200 million dollars oh my gosh and um another big one was advocare they paid 150 million dollars i know a lady who was high up in AdvoCare and they have completely changed their model where you have no downlines. Right. And she left the company because of that, because that was how she made Made money. money. That was how she made money. Mm -hmm. She was like, they've changed my incentive structure. I have no incentive to be here anymore and was really upset about it and was actively looking for the next big MLM. And you know, her life situation has changed and I don't believe she's doing any of that anymore, Mm -hmm. but it's just a a whole lot and they talk you know they can't talk about recruiting as a way to make money it's got to be about sales they don't they like there might be a one-time bonus of bringing somebody in yeah yeah uh but not a not an ongoing downline situation with advocare any longer and they offer a 100 percent refund on unused products so okay maybe a little better but the high ups involved in that case are banned from multi-level marketing businesses in oh. the future for the rest of their lives. Oh. Good. Yeah. Uh, if you decide to join an MLM, we wish you the best of luck. We hope that you uh, find ways not to victimize anyone below you. We hope that the products are amazing and do not ask us to buy them because we will not. We won't. <laughs> we won't. We can love you and not support an MLM. That's you right. are more than the MLM company that you sell for. It's true. It's just true. Yeah. It is hard to talk about it because you and I both have friends who are in this. We have been solicited for purchases 
umpteen times. You and I have both made a stand. I think probably you before me. I think I was late to the mm -hmm. game. I always found excuses. Yeah. And I think finally I kind of got to where you were, where I was like able to say, I just don't support this. Yeah. And um, and I just I think deciding to be honest about that is difficult because you are literally telling somebody that what they've chosen to do for what they believe to be their career in a lot uh -huh. of places is a scam. Is a scam. And that's hurtful. And I recognize that. Like I recognize the burden of that honesty. Right. Um, and there's really very little I can do though, because I just feel compelled to say something about it. Uh-huh. But it is hard also for for them to feel like we still love them and right. care about them. Right. Um well, Ugh. we we have a mutual friend who is a part of one. Yeah. And uh, we said, hey, we're, we're not going to support this. But if you ever decide you want to do this other thing that you make that we think is amazing, I would absolutely buy that stuff from you at a premium yes. to support you. Absolutely. But I cannot buy this other thing. Yeah. I cannot do that. Right. And it's really tough. It is tough to be honest about that. But I think it's one of those decisions you make to be an actual good friend mm -hmm. because you know people need to hear it i you know what okay i regret not being honest with somebody before yeah who is not in my life anymore yeah because that person went from being a friend to being a a, a distributor retailer whatever you want to uh -huh. call it for this mlm and then that is all our friendship was worth Right. Was how much I was going to buy if I was going to host a party. Right. If I was going to, if every time we hung out, it was all about that. And it wasn't just I'm telling you about work. It was I lay want off. you to do this for just, me. I don't right. want to do this. I don't want to do this. Trade it on friendship. Yeah. Isn't that a shame? And I wish I'd have been honest. Yeah. I wish I'd had the Aww. opportunity to say, stop. Yeah. This is not good. You no longer have friends. You only have leads. It's not okay. Right. And yeah. after that, I finally decided, well, I I'm going to be more honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, because it's only fair. And some people are fine with that. Some mm -hmm. people, you tell them, look, I am not your target market, and they'll just leave you alone. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. <sighs> well, next time, we're going to talk about a show called The Stranger on Netflix. It came out last year. And it caught my eye because it was described as the British... You. So you is returning in October to yes. Netflix for a third season. And we're very much looking forward to that. But it's not coming out for a few weeks yet. So it'll be a couple of episodes before we get to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, The Stranger. The I'm Stranger. Hoping, I'm hoping it will fill a little hole while we wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's let's hope so. That's right. Well, thank you so much for listening. We know you make a choice when you listen to us. We really appreciate it. Tell a friend because it's way more fun if you can listen with a friend. And until next time, be safe, be kind, and wash your hands. Bum, 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 bum,